My name is Bridget Hansen. I am a senior research scholar here at Montana State University at the Center for Health and Safety Culture. And thanks again for joining us today for practical suggestions for useful evaluations. If you're new to our work with the center, the Center for Health and Safety Culture is an interdisciplinary center. We conduct research on how, how culture impacts health and safety. We do applied research and evaluation in partnerships with communities, states, tribal organizations, and national organizations across the country who are seeking to improve health and safety. All of our work is applied spo and sponsored by organizations seeking to make a difference. We work in four main core issue areas traffic safety, substance misuse, domestic violence, and child well-being. Across all of these issues and others that you might work in, evaluation is critical for us to understand what works, for whom, under what conditions, and how we can all improve our efforts to best accomplish our goals. I think evaluation is interesting how it's evolved over time, and there's a lot of folks who identify as accidental evaluators. I like this cartoon. I also identify as an accidental evaluator. I didn't set out to be an evaluator. I'm a social psychologist by training. I've always been interested in really applied work. And for the last 15 years, have done a lot of applied research and evaluation in different organizations and communities. Um, oftentimes rural communities to improve health in those areas. Um, I joined the Center for Health and Safety Culture in the summer of 2021, and I'm happy to be contributing to applied research and evaluation across our core issues and on our projects. So before we launch into some of the sort of tips and suggestions we have today, I just wanted to take a moment to align us on the same page about what is program evaluation. There's a lot of words on this slide. There's a lot of different definitions of program evaluation. And I think what's interesting is to be able to look across those definitions and see some of the similarities. So oftentimes we see the word systematic, we see investigation, we see some references to critical assessments or making um, assessments about value, but we also see a focus on improvement. And that's where I'd like us to sort of keep our brains today when we really think about how we can use evaluation to improve our efforts. Um, the American Evaluation Association put together a task force in 2014 to truly try to define what program evaluation is. And something that I think really speaks to our focus that they said from that task force is programs and projects of all kinds aspire to make the world a better place. Program evaluation answers questions like to what extent does the program achieve its goals? How can it be improved? Should it continue? And lots of other questions. And so again, we just want us to focus on thinking about how we can use evaluation in really feasible ways to improve our programs and our strategies and to make more progress towards achieving our goals. So when we think about evaluation and evaluative thinking, one of the first things that we want to take moments to do is to really assess our biases and our assumptions. We want to do that early on and we want to do it often. Um, they really influence the way that we reflect upon our work, the way that we um, analyze our data, the findings that we focus on, and working together across our teams in our multi multidisciplinary and diverse teams can really help us um, to approach our evaluations to get the best kinds of outcomes. When we think about evaluative thinking, I also like to just focus on cultivating curiosity. We're going to talk a lot today about questions, and I think that coming at our evaluation activities with a lens can really help us to ask the best questions and to find information that really helps us to do good work and to improve our efforts. So we might ask questions like, what do we know about our program from a really curious lens? Like, what is it that we know about our program and how it works, if it works? And how do we know these things? How do we know that these things are true? What data do we base it on? What evidence do we have? What are our alternative explanations? for the things that we think are true. And then what would be helpful to know next? So we know what we know now and what would be helpful for us going forward. 
one framework that I think can really help us to uh, ground our evaluation and to progress our evaluative thinking is to think about logic models. Some of you I'm sure are very excited to talk a little bit about logic models today. Others of you might have just switched your screens and started to focus on something else. I think logic models are a little bit polarizing in that way, but they're really, really helpful tools for us, both in program planning and development and in evaluation. So I have here a very basic template of a logic model that we use um, across a few of our projects. So we have the inputs, the things we invest, we have the outputs, our activities, the things that we do and who we reach with those activities. We have our population of focus and we have stakeholders that are involved in our projects and programs. And then of course, through those things, we are trying to achieve our outcomes. We're trying to make the world a better place. And so we have these short-term outcomes that are often changes in knowledge, attitudes, and behavior, and then longer term outcomes that we see over time. Again, this is a fairly simplified template of a logic model. And an example from some of the work that we do, this is a media campaign focused on impaired driving. And so in this example, we might invest understanding about driver and bystander behaviors, about our audience's current knowledge. We also have investments like staff and funding and time to do the work. And we have best practices and things that we know about messaging and communication that are most effective for behavior change. And we'll use those inputs to develop in this example, a universal media campaign where we're trying to reach folks across our county. And we'll also develop tools and resources for key stakeholder groups that we can share with retailers, workplaces, and schools. And by doing these activities, we hope to achieve changes in our short-term outcomes. So increases in knowledge of risks related to impaired driving and increased understanding of opportunities for bystander engagement. Through these short-term outcomes, we hope to lead to longer-term outcomes like decreases in impaired driving and increases in bystander engagement. So again, a fairly simplified version of a logic model that helps us to organize our plans and our activities towards the outcomes that we hope to achieve. I want to share another version of a logic model that you'll see based on the date that I saved a number of years ago um, from a CDC webinar entitled Learning to Love Your Logic Model. I really like this one because of the way that it lays out the logic in those steps. And so it has these early activities. If we do these things, and this is for a childhood lead poisoning program, um, so they're doing outreach and screening and case management for children who have elevated blood lead levels. And then after that, they will do additional things like refer kids, assess environments, then they anticipate early outcomes and then later outcomes. And so in this one, we see less focus on the inputs, um, but a nice linear progression from our early activities through our later activities. And we can clearly see how those then connect to our outcomes. I think there's a lot of value in logic models. And I know that you came to a presentation about evaluation and suggestions there, and we are so close, but I think that Focusing on our logic models has a lot of value to help us design and to develop our programs, to organize and communicate about our programs, to help us make meaning of the work that we do and to see how our activities connect to our outcomes and can really help us to organize, to tell the story of the important work that you do in your communities. And so I would encourage to revisit and update your logic model regularly if you have one. It doesn't have to be perfect, but getting some content into a logic model can be really helpful also for us to align our evaluation activities. So if you are familiar with evaluation, you might know it as different types of evaluation, formative evaluation, which aligns with the inputs that we have in our logic models, process evaluation, which aligns with the outputs, the activities, and the reach to our populations, 
and then outcome or impact evaluation, that summative evaluation that really aligns with the outcomes that we are hoping to achieve in our work. If you're not familiar with the eval words, that's totally fine. Um, we will talk about them in different sections a little bit later on in this presentation, but I think that the logic model can really help us to think about in what places we can use evaluation to improve our work. So we can ask formative evaluation questions about our inputs, right? What are our best practices for messaging and communication? Are we following those best practices becomes a process question. Do we have the right information and the right funding and the right staff to do the work that we need to do? These are formative questions that can really impact how successful we are in our programs. We can ask process questions about the extent to which we're following process, who we're reaching through our media campaigns, who we're reaching with our tools and resources. And then of course we can ask these summative questions about our outcomes. And we'll go into more specific details about each of those phases as we progress. So I think the first main suggestion is really to create a logic model for your program or your strategy or revisit it, right? Maybe you created one when you were putting together a funding application and maybe you haven't looked at it in quite a while. I think dusting that off, taking a look at it can help us to align our evaluation activities to enhance our evaluation questions and to improve our programs. I would also recommend considering more than one logic model. You might have a detailed logic model for a specific program that has the strategies involved. Those might roll up into a bigger logic model across a portfolio of programs. That one probably wouldn't have as much detail about each specific strategy, that's totally fine, but would show the logic across how a portfolio of programs leads to a big picture outcome. You could even have an, a logic model for the entire organization, right? There might be different divisions, different programs, and across that entire organization, how do the inputs, outputs, and outcome line to help us to achieve our goals? We can match the scope and complexity of our logic model to the audience. Different folks need different kinds of logic models. You might have a super complex and detailed logic model about a specific program that the program folks and the evaluators focused on that program can use regularly. And then you might have sort of a big picture, broader logic model that can be used for a board of directors or a coalition to see how a number of different strategies, activities, or programs are working together. We can use those to guide towards our evaluation questions. Looking at our logic models can help us see our opportunities for evaluation and how what we're doing um, can change and evolve based on evaluation. Looking at our logic models can help us to draft questions if we think about what is most helpful to know right now. So looking at my logic model, what do I currently know and what would be most helpful for me to know now? What it will be helpful for me to know soon and farther in the future? This can really align neatly with our program planning and our program development. What do we already know and how do we know it? I think we can also look at our logic model carefully to think about what are we willing and able to do differently? What are the places where it's reasonable for us to make changes? Where if we had more evaluation data, if we had more information, we could make a refinement and an improvement? And what are those places where like, we just know it's not going to be feasible to make a change in the short or medium term? There are some activities that maybe our funder requires us to do or maybe our board of directors is really dedicated to. And so those aren't on the table for changes. There might be other activities or other programs where we're really eager to understand more and to make changes. Laying out our logic models and looking at with an open mind what we're willing to do, but also what we're able to do differently can help us to focus those places for evaluation. We should also revisit and refine our logic models regularly. 
our logic models and also our questions, right? So as we talk about evaluation questions and where we might focus, we want to come back to those regularly and refine them over time. We can indicate our evaluation questions in our logic model. We can add those questions right in there with text boxes or call out boxes um, to say this is the place where we're focusing on evaluation in terms of our logic model. We can highlight what is measured. Inherent in this idea of highlighting the parts of our logic model that we measure is the idea that we often don't measure everything. It's often not appropriate or feasible for us to measure everything. Our logic models can include outcomes that we hope to achieve that we know we'll never be able to measure. It can include activities that we're not able to track for various reasons. Our logic models should be detailed enough for us to understand what's happening that's important, but even if we don't measure it, it can still go in there. We can think about feasible indicators for measuring different components of our logic model. Those can be quantitative, they can be qualitative, they can be success stories. We can use our logic models to align those feasible indicators with our questions. I have an example. This is a current draft logic model for a project that we have focused on supporting health and all policies in rural communities. The activities are really focused on training and education about health and all policies. And through a couple of early conversations with folks involved in the project, we came to this logic model. It has a lot of stuff going on in it. These are all of the planned activities and there's a number of short term outcomes. There was a brainstorm that resulted in many more than those um, ovals that you see there, but we reduced them to those. Similar for the intermediate outcomes, there was a brainstorm that had a big long list of intermediate outcomes and we've reduced them somewhat. Feel free to read, certainly. But what I wanted to like point out here in particular is that we understand that we won't be able to measure all of the components of this logic model. It's not feasible given the budget, given the time, given the scope of the project, but we can use our logic model to really identify those places where we do wanna focus our evaluation efforts and find those places where it's feasible to measure. So for example, in the activities for process evaluation, we know it's reasonable to measure the steering committee's involvement in meetings and trainings. They're a relatively captive audience, they're very engaged, it's reasonable to measure those activities. We also want to measure messaging and branding about health and all policies, and we anticipate activities to reach stakeholders, the general public, and students. Part of the messaging and branding that was identified as important is that it's positively received and appropriate for the audience. You'll see that general public here is not highlighted. We don't think that it's going to be reasonable or feasible for us to measure the reception or reach of messaging and branding to the general public. It's broad. We don't have good access to the entire general public who might receive messages about health and all policies. And so that's not a place where we're going to invest a lot of evaluation effort, but stakeholders who receive messages, students who receive messages, those are places where we can reasonably access those individuals and understand how much messaging and branding they're receiving, talk to them, ask them, um, and if it's positively received and appropriate. Similarly, for some of the short-term outcomes, there are places where we think it will be reasonable for us to measure and assess and places where it's not going to be. An intermediate outcome of increased collaboration. The group sort of thinks that this is increased collaboration among lots of people, among everyone who, are, who is involved in policy development, and planning that could have a health impact. That's pretty hard for us to get our hands around, especially in a relatively short period of time for this project. But 
doing health and all planning and decision making in a few of our agencies who are involved, that's something that we think we'll be able to follow up on to check in on. We might have success stories there that are a feasible indicator of whether doing health and all policies is happening. We're not expecting to be able to measure changes and how much we're not necessarily going to try to quantify that. But again, success stories might be a feasible indicator there. So we went ahead and highlighted it. The long term outcomes, wanting to see things like increased health for all community members. There is secondary data there, of course. Um, and so that is available. It is outside the timeline of the project. Within the one to two years of this project, we wouldn't expect to be able to see those long-term outcomes or measure them as part of the project. And so they're not highlighted, but they certainly exist within our logic model in terms of the kind of change that we're hoping to ultimately achieve. To build these logic models, to develop our evaluation questions, engaging stakeholders is a really important component. Stakeholders for evaluation are broad, but they can help us to understand who is the audience. We often ask this question when we're thinking about results or disseminating information, how to frame the results, how to make sure that they're relevant. We often think about the audience. But I want us to think about thinking about the audience earlier. So who is the audience for the evaluation question? Asking this when we're actually developing the evaluation question can help us to focus and prioritize what those evaluation questions are. Different questions are gonna be more relevant for different kinds of stakeholders. Program staff are going to have likely very different questions than funders, other partners, coalition members. So trying to identify again where there are those opportunities for making change, where new information would be helpful. What is it that we need to know right now? For whom? And what can they do with that information can help us to prioritize across a wide number of evaluation questions. And so when we go back for a moment to our logic model, just to ground us in our logical process from inputs through outputs to outcomes, we might want to ask some evaluation questions about inputs. Some examples would be things like, is there new evidence that we should consider? Maybe we've been doing this project for quite a while or engaged in these kinds of programs for quite a while, and maybe there's new research evidence that could help us to make improvements. How can that latest evidence help us and to guide us in the work that we do? Who's involved in our project and who is ready to take the next step? There might be an opportunity to engage in new activities or to change up some of the things that we're doing? How can we determine who is the most ready to make those steps? Can we do a readiness assessment to really help us to align our inputs and to identify who should be involved? These are just example questions that we might ask about inputs. There might be others. As we move in our logic model from inputs to outputs, we might ask questions about what we're doing and who we're reaching. One suggestion here is to try to identify pretty specifically who exactly is the focus population. Is it all community members? Is it all adults? Is it all kiddos? in middle school in our county? Is it all um, college students who we're working with? Is it college students across the entire country? Trying to identify with a lot of detail and precision that population of focus can help us understand the extent to which we're reaching them. So determining the denominator of reach, right? Who the entire population is goes in the denominator and being able to get a number there can help us to understand the extent to which we're reaching those folks. Then we can track the work that we're doing to fill in the numerator and conduct a gap analysis of who we're missing. I'm going to walk us through an example here. A number of years ago, 
I was involved in a project related to prevention of opioid misuse. And one of the activities was distribution of medication disposal bags. If you're not familiar with medication disposal bags, these are designed to deactivate um, pharmaceuticals and medications in, I believe, carbon like charcoal so that they can be safely disposed of in the trash can in your household trash. So if you're not able to get to a medication um, take back site or drug take back event, folks can use these within their own homes. And so this project that I was involved in um, had a partnership with the local electric utility and they were able to mail a medication disposal bag to all of the households through the electric utility. And the idea was that there was only one electric utility that, ins that served this entire county. And so the thought was that they could reach all of the households in the county with a medication disposal bag by partnering with this electric utility. They sent out many medication disposal bags to all of these households, which is great, right? So people are able to receive them right in their house. They get them in the mail and then they have access when they maybe otherwise wouldn't. But understanding who exactly we're reaching is a little bit more complicated than just knowing that we mailed medication disposal bags to every single household through the electric utility. So there was only, again, one electric utility serving that region. And so each of those households received a medication disposal bag. But when we thought a little bit more about the community, we realized that, of course, there are these households, but then there are also other folks. There are people who live in apartment buildings where they don't have an individual electric bill, and instead it's included in their rent, it's paid by the building as a whole, or other folks who might rent in a duplex kind of situation. In this particular community, there are also a number of folks off the grid. So maybe they had solar electricity only or a generator. Maybe they lived in RVs for part of the year or all of the year. Um, so they may not have been a customer of the local electric utility, and so they weren't actually reached from those efforts. Of course, there are other community members also to consider. So there are individuals who are experiencing homelessness or folks who might just be more transient in and out of the community who aren't getting a medication disposal bag. So thinking cohesively about who our target audience is in this particular example, it was all households in the county. That was the goal. The hope was to reach all households. Can help us to better understand if that's in fact who we are reaching. So everyone in our target population, in our focus population, is in the denominator. So I've moved them below the line here. Um, and then in this example, the reach was the households through the electric utility, which is part of our population, but wasn't our entire population of focus. And so we can use different data sources to understand these groups. We can use census data to get a count of households in our provides us both individual numbers and also number of households. Um, for some target population groups or focus population groups, census data won't be available, but there might be other ways to estimate or other data sources like from academic institutions or schools, depending on who the focus population is. And then we can use our tracking data um, to measure and keep track over time in terms of who in fact we are reaching. And doing this kind of activity can really help us to move some of those folks from the denominator, but missed in the numerator into the numerator or reached by our strategies. Um, I also just want to point out here that when we think about identifying our denominator and figuring out who all is in there, sometimes that just involves a lot more of these conversations with stakeholders, right? And thinking carefully about who it is that we might be missed. Having an intentional focus on who we want to reach, but we're not reaching. We can do that both quantitatively by getting this estimate 
of our numerator and denominator of our reach, but we can also do it logically by reflecting on who is involved in our schools, who is not involved, who might be experiencing a lot of absences, or if we're trying to focus on young adults and we're working through universities, who are the young adults in our community who aren't involved in the university? And what are some other ways that we can reach those folks? I like asking these kinds of questions about reach in our outputs because it can really pretty quickly inform strategy changes or enhancements. So in our example of medication disposal bags, there are other ways to get more bags um, to the rest of the population that was missed. We can put them in the lobbies of the apartment buildings, or we could work with landlords to make sure that folks who live in those places have access to medication disposal bags. We can work with shelters or with community organizations providing services to individuals who experience homelessness to help ensure access for those individuals as well. But if we don't take that time to reflect on who we're missing, we might miss this opportunity to make strategy changes or enhancements. And those kinds of activities don't have to cost a lot of money. We don't necessarily have to do a lot of different work in terms of how we track. Um, it can just be a matter of us thinking about it a little bit differently and being intentional about pondering who it is that we're missing. Other evaluation questions that we might ask about inputs are how well or completely are we implementing the program? If we're working on implementing an evidence-based program, we can ask with how much fidelity are we um, implementing our activities? Do we have a fidelity checklist? Are we able to do an assessment? Are there any critical components that we're missing? Um, if we're adapting evidence-based programs, which we often do to make sure that they're appropriate for our communities, do we have all of the critical components? When we reflect on our activities, if in our logic model, we have the critical components clearly identified, then in our process evaluation, we can focus on those parts of our activities, those critical components in our activities and determine the extent to which we are complete in terms of implementing the critical components and with how much fidelity we're doing that. Somebody in the chat has asked about fidelity in this context, and I think that that's a really good question. If other folks have questions, please feel free to come off mute and ask them or to put them in the chat box. So fidelity here, especially if we're talking about doing an evidence-based program or adapting an evidence-based program, fidelity refers to the extent to which we are being true to those critical components um, and the extent to which we are able to implement that program with fidelity. And so we would rely on the research evidence to tell us what are the critical components. A lot of evidence-based programs do have fidelity checklists, and so we might be able to make some observations in terms of the activities um, to see to what extent we are able to determine if we are implementing with fidelity and maybe where we could make some changes to increase the fidelity to the evidence-based program. As we move into evaluation questions about outcomes, and so as we get further along in our logic model, I think oftentimes this part is a little bit easier. Folks often have a lot of evaluation ideas about short-term outcomes. These are the things that we expect to change based on our strategy implementation or our activities. What are the changes in knowledge, attitudes, and behavior that we're hoping to see amongst our participants? Questions that we might consider include, when do we expect these immediate effects and what opportunities do we have to observe them? And so we might not be able to measure all of our short-term outcomes again, but which ones are timely for us and when can we expect to do that? What opportunities do we have to be able to take a look at our short-term outcomes? We might look to see what secondary data sources exist 
to really help us with our outcomes. It might not be feasible for us to measure um, independently in our evaluations, but we might be able to rely on secondary data sources to help us. For outcomes, one of the main recommendations or suggestions that I wanted to make was related actually to longer term outcomes. So oftentimes we find it's not feasible to track long term outcomes. Like I mentioned in my example about health and all policies, sometimes it falls outside of the scope in terms of timeline or the scope in terms of budget. But if we think ahead to what those long term outcomes might be that we want to measure later on, we can really capitalize on some opportunities now that would allow us to be in the position where if things were to change, we would be able to do some outcome evaluation down the road a little ways. I've seen some programs and have had opportunities from additional funding or new partnerships to be able to expand their outcome evaluation and haven't been able to because they actually aren't able to make contact with folks who participated in the program. So if you're part of a organization that's been around for a long time that you expect to continue in the future, if your coalition is starting work or has been doing work and has a long-term plan, you might consider just gathering basic info about the participants that would enable potential follow-up down the road, even if you don't necessarily plan for it right now. Um, sometimes we have these opportunities right now where we have our participants and they are available to us. And if we don't capitalize on that opportunity, it, we won't have it again. I think that this is especially relevant when we talk about programs that serve young adults or youth. Um, and I know that many community organizations and coalitions are really focused on young people. Young people's life circumstances change a lot, right? Um, especially if we think about longer term and over a period of a lot of years. And so gathering some information, specifically contact information, when we have access to those folks now can really set us up to be able to follow up with them later if the opportunity were to arise. And again, I don't think that this has to be very burdensome or very expensive. But if we don't take the opportunity now, we would lose it. So some specific suggestions would be to make sure that we gather personal email addresses from folks, um, even if it's like an employees in an organization that we're working with, college students, their employer email addresses, and their university email addresses are likely to change. Their personal email addresses are less likely to change. And so that can be one simple way to sort of have greater likelihood of being able to follow up with them later. And with young people or children, I would encourage collecting parents' contact information with the express purpose of keeping it for potential follow-up later. So again, asking those folks for their personal email addresses as well um, and storing it with the idea that if we have new opportunities down the road to be able to follow up using this contact information that we gather now would allow us to be able to do that. So when we think about how to make our evaluations the most useful, I hope that there's been a couple of tips in terms of taking our logic model and identifying in different phases there, but also across the different example questions, I think there's a lot of importance in answering who will the evaluation be useful for and how. So really thinking critically about, is it the program folks? Is it the coalition? Is it the funder? Who is in a position to use evaluation results and how will they do that? Will they use it to ask for more funding? Will they use it to refine their strategies and their activities? Which ones are in a good place to make changes? Oftentimes we have a lot of evaluation questions. There's great potential for evaluation and that can be a little bit overwhelming sometimes, but thinking carefully about who the evaluation will be useful for and how can really help us to prioritize those things. It's not 
important to get it perfect, right? It's not important to identify the perfect evaluation questions and the perfect data sources. But I think that if we come at it from a lens of thinking about what is useful, what is useful now, what is likely to be useful in the near future, that can help us to prioritize and help us to align in a way that can help us to improve the work that we do. We can always change. And so if we focus on one evaluation question now, maybe we focus on reach and thinking about who we're missing. Once we sort of feel like we've captured that and have a good understanding that we've reached as much of our focus population as we need to or want to, we can switch gears. We certainly have limited capacity we only have so many hours in the day, we only have so many staff, and so prioritizing what is most useful for us now can help us. Stakeholder engagement also improves both our evaluation questions and our utilization, so involving more people in these conversations. We might not frame them as evaluation conversations. All of you wanted to come to a presentation about useful evaluation today. Some folks are like, no thanks. Um, we can set up these conversations in different ways. We can focus on improvement. We can focus on planning and integrate and weave the evaluation into those conversations. Again, I think a logic model helps us to do that and bringing in perspectives of a number of different people can help us identify how it can be most useful. I also want to encourage people to plan on incremental steps. We don't have to do all of it at one time. In fact, it's probably unlikely, but taking small steps, incremental steps to support our program improvement and our own learning can be very useful for us. I wanted to spend a moment with a note about complexity. I think there's probably some of you who are attending who are thinking like, but I don't have one strategy, I don't have one program, or I'm working in systems change, I don't have a logic model. We know the long-term outcome. What if we only know that we're trying to make big change in a system towards our long-term outcome? There might not be a logic model. If we're working in fields of innovation, of big change, if we're working on wicked problems, oftentimes we don't have a linear plan. I would encourage folks to still think about logic modeling a little bit. What is it that we are inputting? What are our resources? What are some of the activities? It's okay to leave blanks. It's okay to say, I don't know exactly who this is gonna reach. I'm gonna try to figure it out. It's okay to say, I don't know exactly what all of the short-term outcomes are. The important thing isn't to fill it all in perfectly, but I think if we can start to lay out some of those activities, it can help us to identify some of the places for evaluation. The center has started to do some work in developmental evaluation. It's a certain kind or framework of evaluation that really does support innovation. It supports learning, continuous learning, rapid feedback that can help us do better. And so if we're in a place of big systems change, if our coalitions are trying to do a lot of work across a number of different areas, we might still benefit from logic models that bring in a number of different activities, but we can also draw on some of this developmental evaluation work to help support us in innovative areas. As we talk about evaluation and we think about about evaluators, I think we can all think about ourselves as evaluators in one way or another. It might not be the only hat that we wear. We might do a lot of different things, um, but spending a little bit of dedicated time thinking about evaluation can be what put, pushes us into that useful area, right? So if we look at our logic models, if we think about what kinds of questions we can ask, how the answers to those questions will be useful and by whom, we can all make progress um, towards being evaluators and using evaluation to improve our work. You might have internal and or external evaluators that you already work with. You might have a program or a project that has a specific evaluator. That's great. Hopefully that person is really helpful for you. It still might be beneficial to think about 
again, maybe a logic model that combines a number of different programs. And so we can see over time and how they might all work together to help us achieve our goals. And so if you have a specific evaluator who's focused on one aspect, it still might be helpful to bring that person together with other evaluators or with other staff to think about uh, more broadly how evaluation can serve us in our communities in the work that we do. If you're looking for an evaluator, the American Evaluation Association has a find an evaluator tool. It can help us to just understand sort of who might be already in our community, who is doing this work. Oftentimes you can reach out to your local university if you're looking for somebody to give you a little bit of support. Our team is here happy to brainstorm ideas, to bounce ideas, to think about how evaluation can serve us and to help to improve the work that we do. Thank you so much for your time and attention. As I shared what I hope are a couple of suggestions of how we can think about making our evaluations more useful. Um, if you have any questions, I would welcome them. Feel free to take yourself off of mute or to ask them in the chat box. Do you have a couple more slides after we talk through some questions? Okay, there well. is one question in the chat. Can coalitions be evaluated as well? If so, can you recommend an evaluator at little or no cost? Thank you, Karen, and thank you for the question. Coalitions can certainly be evaluated. I think sometimes it's a little bit unclear for a coalition or the folks that are involved in different ways in the coalition what exactly some of the shorter term outcomes are. Again, I think a logic model can really help us here. Sometimes a coalition sets out to achieve big changes in their community, which is really, really admirable. And sometimes we know what those big changes are, what the long-term outcomes are, and we know what the activities are because we know what's happening. But working in this logic model can really help us to identify what additional activities might be needed to help us to achieve the short-term outcomes that are likely to improve the likelihood of success towards the long-term outcomes. I don't have like a specific tool to recommend in terms of coalitions, but I think thinking about coalition goals is a really excellent place to start, as is thinking about what information the coalition needs to do to improve the activities that they're doing or to improve the way that they maybe work together or work in the communities. So if there is a goal of improved collaboration, there are collaboration scales, there are collaboration tools that can be used to make some assessments there, if that information would be helpful. Um, that's just one example, right? So I think if we think about what the goals are of the coalition and putting that into a logic model um, can definitely help us to align some of our evaluation questions. Happy to have more specific conversations about that if that's useful. It might depend on the topic a little bit too. Before we wrap up, I wanted to share some other activities that are happening at the center and some upcoming opportunities. And so in April, my colleague Katie Dively will be talking about what is guide service. Guide service is the service that the center offers to coalitions, communities, and organizations, and Katie is our guide. And so she'll give a free webinar on April 12th, just introducing folks to guide service and talking about that. You can register on our website. We also have a return to in-person for our positive culture framework training. It will be happening at the end of March in Charlotte, North Carolina. Registration is currently open. There's only a couple of spots left. So if in-person training is something that you, your colleagues are interested in, um, you can check out the website for more information there or reach out to us. Uh, and then finally, this slide just presents other services at the center. And so you might know that we do training, again, guide service. You can learn more about that on our website or at that webinar. We offer assessments, surveys, evaluation services, and free webinars on a variety of topics. 
thank you for attending this one today. It will be on our YouTube channel along with all of these other ones. Um, if you are interested in more information about any of those services, feel free to reach out. And again, if you have um, questions about evaluation, if you want to brainstorm evaluation for your organization or your coalition specifically, feel free to reach out to me. I would love to have those talks. Um, we have a few minutes before the end of our hour, and so if anyone wants to have some of that conversation now, you can feel free to come off of mute and we can do that. Otherwise, thank you so much for your time. Take care.